Hey everybody! This video continues our discussion of AP Biology Topics 2.5 through 2.7, with a special focus on active transport, bulk transport, and the cell wall. In many biological situations, there is a different concentration of a particular ion or small molecule inside compared with the outside of a cell. In these cases, the concentration imbalance is maintained by a protein in the cell membrane that moves the substance against its concentration gradient. This is called active transport, and because it is acting against the normal flow, it requires the expenditure of energy. Often, the energy source is the nucleotide adenosine triphosphate, or ATP for short. In eukaryotes, ATP is produced in the mitochondria and plastids, and it has chemical energy stored in its terminal phosphate bond. This energy is released when ATP is converted to adenosine diphosphate, or ADP, in a hydrolysis reaction that breaks the bond between the terminal phosphate and the rest of the molecule. The differences between diffusion and active transport are summarized here. In many cases of simple and facilitated diffusion, ions or molecules can move down their concentration gradients in either direction across the cell membrane. In contrast, active transport is directional and moves a substance either into or out of a cell or organelle depending on the transport protein's function. As in facilitated diffusion, there is usually a specific carrier protein for each substance that is transported. There are two basic types of active transport. Primary active transport involves the direct hydrolysis of ATP, which provides the energy required for transport. And secondary active transport, which does not use ATP directly. Instead, its energy is supplied by an ion concentration gradient, or an electrical gradient, established by prim primary active transport. This transport system uses the energy of ATP indirectly to set up the gradient. In primary active transport, energy released by the hydrolysis of ATP drives the movement of specific ions against their concentration gradients. For example, the concentration of potassium ions inside of a cell is often much higher than the concentration in the fluid bathing the cell. However, the concentration of sodium ions is often much higher outside the cell. A protein in the cell membrane pumps sodium ions out of the cell and potassium ions into the cell against these concentration gradients, ensuring that the gradients are maintained. This is called the sodium-potassium pump and is an integral membrane glycoprotein that is found in all animal cells. It breaks down a molecule of ATP to ADP and a free phosphate ion, and uses the released energy to bring down two potassium ions into the cell and export three sodium ions. In secondary active transport, the movement of a substance against its concentration gradient is accomplished using energy regained by letting ions move across the membrane down their concentration gradients. For example, once the sodium-potassium pump establishes a concentration gradient of sodium ions, the passive diffusion of some sodium ions back into the cell can provide the secondary active transport of glucose into the cell. This occurs when glucose is absorbed into the bloodstream from the digestive tract Secondary active transport is usually accomplished by a single protein that moves both the ion and the actively transported molecule across the membrane. In some cases, the ion and the transported molecule move in opposite directions, whereas in others, they move in the same direction, as for glucose and sodium ions in the digestive tract here. Secondary active transport aids in the uptake of amino acids and sugars, which are essential raw materials for cell maintenance and growth. So far, we have examined a number of passive and active ways by which ions and small molecules can enter and leave cells. But what about large molecules such as proteins? Many proteins are so large that they diffuse very slowly, 
and their bulk makes it difficult for them to pass through the phospholipid bilayer. It takes a completely different mechanism to move intact large molecules across the membrane. Macromolecules such as proteins, polysaccharides, and nucleic acids are simply too large and too charged or polar to pass through biological membranes. This is a fortunate property. Cellular integrity depends on containing these macromolecules in specific locations. However, Cells must sometimes take up or secrete intact large molecules. This is done via vesicles, and the general term for the mechanisms by which cells secrete and take up large mo molecules or particles are exocytosis and endocytosis. Exocytosis is the process by which materials packaged in vesicles are secreted from the cell. When the vesicle membrane fuses with the cell membrane, an opening is made to the outside of the cell. The contents of the vesicle are released into the environment, and the vesicle membrane is smoothly incorporated into the cell membrane. In Topic 2.1, we encountered exocytosis as the last step in the processing of material engulfed by phagocytosis the release of digested materials back into the extracellular environment. Secreted proteins are also transported out of the cell via exocytosis. The proteins are folded and modified in the endoplasmic reticulum and then transported in vesicles to the Golgi apparatus where they may be further modified. Finally, the proteins are packaged in new vesicles for secretion. Exocytosis is important in the secretion of many types of substances, including digestive enzymes from the pancreas, neurotransmitters from neurons, and materials for the construction of the plant cell wall in palisade cells. Endocytosis is a general term for a group of processes that brings small molecules, macromolecules, large particles, and even small cells into eukaryotic cells. The cell membrane invaginates or folds inwards, forming a small pocket around materials from the environment. The pocket deepens, forming a vesicle, and this vesicle separates from the cell membrane with its contents to the cell interior. There are three broad types of endocytosis, phagocytosis, pinocytosis, and receptor endocytosis. In phagocytosis, also known as cellular eating, Receptors in the cell membrane recognize a specific ligand on the surface of a large particle or even an entire cell. The binding of the ligand to the receptor causes the phagocytic cell to engulf the particle or other cell. Phagocytosis is restricted to specialized cells. For example, unicellular protists use phagocytosis for feeding, and while some white blood cells use phagocytosis to engulf foreign cells and substances. The food vesicle, also called a phagosome, that forms usually fuses with a lysosome where the vesicle's contents are digested. Vesicles can also form pinocytes, which is known as cellular drinking. However, in this case, the vesicles bring fluids and dissolve substances, including proteins, into the cell. Pinocytosis is relatively nonspecific regarding what it brings into the cell. For example, pinocytosis goes on constantly in the endothelium, the single layer of cells that separates a blood capillary from the surrounding tissue. Pinocytosis allows cells of the endothelium to rapidly acquire fluids and dissolved solutes from the blood. And finally, we have receptor endocytosis, sometimes also referred to as receptor-mediated endocytosis. This is a mechanism for bringing specific large molecules recognized by specific receptors into the cell. In recent years, it has become clear that receptor endocytosis also plays an important role in cell signaling, which we will discuss more in Unit 4. Put simply, Receptor endocytosis allows cells to control their internal processes by controlling the location and abundance of each type of receptor on the cell membrane.
Endocytosis is important in the absorption of many types of substances, including antigen absorption in plasma B cells, which are also referred to as B lymphocytes, and the intake of macromolecules in macrophage cells. In Topic 2.3, we looked at the role of the cell membrane. Although the cell membrane is a functional barrier between the inside and outside of the cell, cells produce molecules and secrete them to the outside of the cell membrane. There, these molecules form structures that play essential roles in protecting, supporting, or attaching to each other. Because they're outside the cell membrane, these structures are said to be extracellular. In eukaryotes, these structures are made up of two components, a fibrous macromolecule and a gel-like medium in which fibers are embedded. In cells, the cell wall has three major roles. It provides support for the cell and limits the volume of a mature cell by remaining rigid. It acts as a barrier to infection by fungi and other organisms that can cause plant diseases. And it contributes to plant form by controlling the direction of cell expansion during growth and development. Different types of eukaryotic cells contain cell walls that are made up of different materials, all of which are polymers of carbohydrates. Plant cell walls are made of cellulose. Fungal cell walls are made up of chitin. And bacterial cell walls are made up of peptidoglycan. Because of their thick cell walls, plant cells viewed under a light microscope appear to be entirely isolated from one another. The cytoplasm of adjacent plant cells are connected by numerous cell membrane lines channels called plasmodesmata. These are about 20 to 40 nanometers in diameter and extend through the cell walls. Plasmodesmata allow water, ions, small molecules, hormones, and even some RNA and protein molecules to move between connected cells. In this way, Energy-rich molecules such as sugars can be shared among cells, and plant hormones can affect growth at sites far from where they were first synthesized. This intracellular communication integrates a plant organ composed of thousands of cells. We will discuss plant plasmodesmata in more detail when we talk about cell communication later in Unit 4. This video has brought to an end our discussion on cell transport in the AP Biology Topics 2.4 through 2.7, a key takeaway and differentiation between passive transport and active transport is that passive transport does not require energy and allows substances to go with their concentration gradients, that is, from an area of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration. Active transport, on the other hand, does require energy and often moves materials against their concentration gradients, that is, from an area of lower concentration to an area of higher concentration. 